Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Welcome to our 550th episode special. If you have a comment, email it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and become one of our friends on Facebook. This 550th episode special uh, is brought to you by the support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all your financial support. Well, we're going to bring you something really special. It's the first time we played an episode of the series Murder Clinic. I think I talked about this series about a year or so ago when I first uh, discovered it, but this is the first time we're playing it. Murder Clinic was a series that aired for uh, about 16 months over WOR Mutual uh, in uh, New York. That was the flagship uh, station of the Mutual Broadcasting uh, System, aired from July of 1942 uh, with the last series ending October uh, the 27th of 1943. And what Murder Clinic did is each uh, episode adapted a uh, well-beloved detective story from some of the popular detectives of the era. Some remain uh, fairly well-known with fans to this day, such as Parker Pine, Father Brown, Philip Trim, Gideon Fell, uh, Poirot, uh, and uh, the old man in the corner, uh, as as uh, as well as many others. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of these episodes have been lost, and of uh, and of the six episodes that survive, five are uh, featuring detectives that most people would not recognize but still had a great deal of popularity towards the uh, beginning to uh, uh, middle part of the uh, 20th century. As we're bringing you uh, Candy Matson, I thought it'd be good to bring out a kind of uh, precursor character to Candy Matson, and that is Madame Rosica Story. Rosica Story was the brainchild of Canadian novelist uh, Holbert Footner. Uh, and uh, she was a female crime solver. She presented herself in uh, the books as a practical psychologist. Her stories appeared for 12 years, amounting to five novels and a total of 30 short stories. Unlike other female crime solvers of the era, Story was a professional who earned money for her services and never married during the 12 year run of the series. She was accompanied in her uh, adventures by her secretary, Bella Brickley, who was kind of her Dr. Watson. This particular uh, story that Murder Clinic did uh, was originally done uh, as a short story published 16 years before in 1926 in the uh, collection Madam Story. So, from September 22nd of 1942, with Madame Rosica's story, here is The Scrap of Lace. Murder Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives, Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the world's great detectives of fiction and invites you to listen to the story of his most exciting case. Tonight, Madame Rosica's story in The Scrap of Lace. Good evening, Madame Story. Your being at Murder Clinic is certainly a novelty. You're surprised to see a woman detective, Mr. Knight? That's right. And even more surprised to see a very beautiful detective. <laughs> <laughs> it's a queer business for a woman. <laughs> Most people think so, Mr. Knight. But you see, being a woman gives me one great advantage. My adversaries usually underestimate me. Yes, I suppose they would. <laughs> now, what's the tale you're going to tell us, Madam Story? It's called The Scrap of Lace. I chose it because it seems to me so unusual a crime. A strange story of jealousy and death. Of course you know the great family of Kruger who ruled New York society for generations. 
When Mrs. Peter John Kruger III died, her mantle descended as a matter of course to Mrs. Peter John Kruger IV. This beautiful and charming young woman, Mimi by name, inherited not only her mother-in-law's scepter, but also Teresa de Guion. Teresa de Guion was the first and certainly the greatest of social secretaries. The story begins one summer morning at Carris Woods, the enormous and rather monstrous Kruger estate in Upper Westchester. Mimi and Teresa de Guion were together in the breakfast room. Oh, Teresa, must we go to that dull dinner at the Bransoms tonight? I think I'll call it off. Mimi, you simply can't do that. Hmm? The dinner's being given for you. Hmm. I was most insistent that I be consulted about the other guests. After all, my dear, you have certain responsibilities. Your mother-in-law, Mrs. Kruger the third. Yes, but... I know. She was a paragon of the social virtues. She didn't mind being bored to death. Oh, Mimi, you are so like. What would you do without me? <laughs> ah, you worry too much, Teresa. You're living in the past. Your little assistant, Louise Mayfield, could possibly take over very well. Louise? Louise Mayfield? That's right, that child. My dear Teresa, she's 21 and very competent. After all, you trained her. Yes, and I am very fond of Louise. She's like a daughter to me. But take my place? Why, surely you're joking, my dear. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You know Mimi. I'm a bit worried about Louise. She's been acting very odd lately. This party she's going to tonight, I have no idea where it is or who her hostess is to be. Well, wherever it is, she'll have a better time than I will. You know, Teresa, I shouldn't be surprised if Louise has been acting strangely because she's trying to keep away from my handsome cousin, Jack Roper. She doesn't seem very grateful to you, Teresa, for arranging to marry him off to Vera McPeak. Jack Rokeliffe and Vera McPeak are a splendid match. He has family, position. Vera is young. She can be molded. She can be taught. Oh, <laughs> oh certainly, yes. And her father has 100 millions. But I don't blame Jack for straying from the fold. Louise is very lovely. And I found Vera a very trying guest. In fact, I find it all very trying. Mr. Oh, there's Louise. Uh, Louise, we're in the breakfast room. Uh, come in here, my dear. Good morning, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. Grion, did you want me this morning? Uh, no, Louise, I did. Teresa insists we go to this dinner tonight. Jack and Vera are going with us. We'll be leaving around seven. Uh, tell Jack, won't you? Must I, Mrs. Kruger? Mrs. Kruger has asked you to deliver a message. Do so, my dear. <laughs> Jack, I came only to tell you about the dinner. Oh, Louise. Please. Must we go through all this again? Why don't you leave me alone? Because I'm mad about you, Louise. Can't you understand? I'm in love with you. I want you to marry me. <laughs> you. Marry and support a wife. Don't be silly, Jack. It does sound silly, doesn't it? But I'm changed, I tell you. You changed me, Louise. I love you. There's, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And what about Vera McPeak? Oh. No, Jack. I'm afraid you've been bought, paid for, and delivered. Vera won't let you go so easily. I'll tell her tonight that I'm through, Louise. I'll meet her at the dinner and tell her, and then I'll come back here to you. Come back if you like, Jack. Good. I'll be back at about... But I won't be here. Where are you going, Louise? Why don't you tell me? It's not a man. I know it's not a man. Who is it? Who is it? Nonsense has gone far enough. What I do is my own business. Do you understand that, Jack? No, it's my business. You're mine, Louise. Do you hear? You're mine. I'll have you or no one else will. Jack, let go of my wrist. Louise, tell me. You're hurting me. Please. Louise, I want to know. Let me go. Well, Jack, you're yeah. making passes at the servants, I see. And perhaps it's just as well you saw. Might as well have this out now. Shut up. I can handle this. It's pretty easy to see what Miss Mayfield's little game is. She thinks she'll marry into the great Kruger clan. Well, let me tell you, Miss Mayfield. Jack hasn't got a cent to his name and never will have. Vera, please. I understand perfectly, Miss McGee. I assure you, I have no ambitions in Mr. Roker's direction. Quite the lady, aren't you, Miss Mayfield? Well, watch your step. Sure, I know what you all think of me. Vulgar. Common. <laughs> but let me tell you. We common claim at Peaks from Pittsburgh know how to get what we want. And we know how to keep it. Think that over, Miss Mayfield. Think that over. Mm 
Yes, come in. Please. Madam Kruger has sent me to help you dress for your engagement. <laughs> come in, look. How thoughtful of Mrs. Kruger to send you, Susanna. Have they gone? Oh, please, because she left long ago. Oh, don't you see? We're not happy. Monsieur Jacques? You say nothing. And Mademoiselle, his fiance, the ugly one, she... <laughs> oh, you say, she's very angry. Even Madame, she wants not to go. Well, let's not think of them, Suzanne. I'm happy, and I'm going to have a wonderful time. Now, Mademoiselle is très charmant. Very lovely. It is a kiss you go to, Miss Fat. It is for your young man that your eyes shine so. Hmm? <laughs> Maybe. You're too smart, Suzanne. How do I look? Oh, rather sad, Mademoiselle. You eat you up. You are so lovely. Suzanne, you are a darling. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Hey, let us you. Thank you. It is a letter for you, Mademoiselle. Hmm. That's a thick one, isn't it? Oh, how lovely. What an exquisite handkerchief. Who could have sent it to me? Madame Kruger must have sent it. It is one of the six she bought in Paris. It is perfect, Mademoiselle, for your costume, Miss Oh, it's lovely. What a darling Mrs. Kruger is. Mm, she is most generous. Shall I put this scent, the perfume, on it, Mademoiselle? No, thank you. I'll do it myself, Suzanne. Oh, just put that bottle of Gardenia perfume on my dressing table, please. Here, Mademoiselle. Now you can go, Suzanne. I won't need you anymore. Merci, Mademoiselle. Good night, Suzanne, and thank you. Hmm. Oh, it's very lovely. One more day. <sighs> Suzanne. of experience, Mimi. I have never had to cope with anything so, so sordid. Teresa, how, how can you think of appearances with Louise, that beautiful child, lying I... in there dead? But I must think of them. After all, Dr. Plummer refuses to sign a death certificate. <laughs> that old fossil with his hints of foul play. Well, maybe he's right, Vera. Maybe what do you so... mean, Jack? What do you know of Louise Mayfield's death? Well, I... Stop wrangling, you two. Dr. Plummer was kind enough to give us 36 hours. He's risking a great deal going as far as that. Oh, why doesn't Madam Story get here? Are you sure you acted wisely in calling her in, Mimi? Well, it was either she or the police. You said she had a reputation for discretion. Come in. Yes? Madam Rosita Story and Miss Bella Brittley. Thank heaven you're here, Madam Story. This is a terrible situation. Terrible. Oh, but let me introduce you. I am Teresa de Guillaume. This is Mrs. Peter John Kruger, the third. How, How do you do? do? Miss McKeek. Hello. Mr. Mr. Roper. How do you do, How do, you do Roper? It was good of you to come so quickly, Madam Story. This unfortunate accident is likely to create a distressing scandal for Mrs. Kruger. Accident, Mr. Guillaume? From what you told me over the phone, I gathered Louise Mayfield had been murdered. Nonsense. You don't know that, Madam Story. Nobody does. We only know Louise is dead. Poor child. We found her when we returned last night from our dinner party. It is nonsense, Teresa, and you know it. Madame Story is perfectly right. It'd be very foolish to ask her help and not, not give her all the facts. What facts, Mimi? Just because that old fossil of a Dr. Plummer won't give a death certificate. You ask me, it's a nice little scheme to get you to hire this Story woman and split whatever she can manage to get out of you. Vera! That's an interesting idea, Miss McPeak, though I must confess that so simple and clever a scheme would never have occurred to me. But surely Dr. Plummer offered some other reason for refusing a death certificate. Yes. He says... Oh, it's impossible, but he says Louise was asphyxiated. Oh, fool, there isn't a gas outlet in the house. How helpful of you to know that, Miss McKeith. You won't mind, will you, if I check for myself? No, I don't mind what you do. Oh, what's the use of all this? We've nothing to tell. All of us were at a dinner party 20 miles from here together. 
When we got home after 11, we found Louise... Well, that is Miss Mayfield dead. I see. Mr. Guion, when you phoned me, you said something about some missing object. Suzanne, the maid, insists a lace handkerchief came in the mail for Louise as she was dressing to leave. When we found her, the handkerchief had disappeared. Very interesting. Suppose I start, then, by questioning this maid, Suzanne. Maybe she can tell me more about this missing handkerchief. Good morning, Bella. Good morning, Madam Story. Typing last night's notes, I see. Yes. Say, you look worried. What is it? Oh, how can one look out at that peaceful garden and realize that in this house there's someone carrying the mark of Cain on their soul? And you believe Louise Mayfield's death was not a natural one? That she was murdered? No doubt of it. Bella, that girl was asphyxiated. Oh, how horrible. So young and so full of life. And it's our job to find out who killed her. Have you finished typing those notes who took at our interminable interviews last night? Not quite. I'm almost finished. Well, then I think I'll step out in the terrace. Maybe the fresh air will help me think. Something is bothering you. Yes, Bella. What happened to that lace handkerchief Louise Mayfield received in the mail? I'm sure that was the thing that killed her. I must find it. Do call me when you're through with those notes, please. Ah, Madam Story. You come out and shame the flowers and dim the sunlight. You always make such pretty speeches, even so early in the morning, Mr. Rochliffe. Oh, beautiful lady. You remember my name. Yours would be a difficult name to forget, Mr. Rochliffe. Hmm? Thanks to the Rotary Review and the Picture Magazine. Oh, that. You know, I had no hope of ever meeting you. I can't aspire to your circle. Much too clever. Hmm, it all depends. I should say that you were quite clever enough for your own purposes, Mr. Rochliffe. <laughs> I'm just a lightweight. I wonder... I see you're standing out under her window. That is Miss Mayfield's room up there, isn't it? Yes. Well, that was her room. Ivy-clad walls, old English ivy. Dirty and strong, too. I wonder why the vines are so torn and broken. Oh, are they? I, I hadn't noticed. You loved Louise Mayfield very much, didn't she? Yes. I loved her more than anything in life. And she? Oh, why should she care for me? What am I? Nothing but a wastrel. She was in love with someone else. I know it. I could tell. But if I'd known who it was, I... Why didn't you tell me, Mr. Rochliffe? You'd left your dinner party and came back here last night. How did you know that I did? I didn't. You just told me. Thank you. Hey, you see, I, I told you you're too clever for me. What time was it when you got here? Well, I don't, don't know. It... It's about 9.30, I think. I see. You came around back here in the garden. You saw a light in her window, called her, got no answer. And you climbed that ivy up to her window, didn't you? Well, uh, who saw me? Nobody, as far as I know. That broken ivy tells its own story, but not all of it. Tell me, what did you do when you got up there? I suppose you're thinking that I killed her. I wouldn't blame you if you did. I don't care much if you do. I've got nothing more... Please, please, Mr. Sorry. Well, I I went in and found her lying there on the floor, dead. Then, like the coward I am, I got scared. How could I explain my being there? So I climbed down again the way I went up and drove back to Quaker Ridge. I suppose you don't believe me. Suppose I say I reserve judgment. Now, will you give me the handkerchief that you took from Louise Mayfield's hand? How did you know that? Stop this. I suppose that you took it as a remembrance of her. Yes, I, I did. It was the last thing she had touched. Here it is. Madam Story, Madam Story, could you come into the office a moment? We'll continue this talk later, Mr. Rochliffe. Will you excuse me now, please? Uh, this letter was pushed under the door. Did you open it, Bella? No. I saw it was addressed to Louise Mayfield, so I called you. Let's see. Hmm. Postmark Briarcliff. There's a notation on the envelope in pencil. Hmm. Not a very literate correspondent, Bella. 
If you want to buy any more info about this letter, we can make a deal. I'll drop around at 11. Well, we have long to wait. Now, let's read the letter. Darling, I can hardly wait till Tuesday night when I'll see you again. I'm moving heaven and earth to arrange things so we'll be together for always. All my love, dear. It's signed J. J? That must be Jack Rowcliffe. In the light of what we know of their relationship, does it sound like Jack Rowcliffe? No, that's stupid of me. But the initial. It could be the J stands for John. Peter... Peter John Kruger. Uh Uh-huh. This must be our mysterious correspondent now. Come in. Well, lady, there I am. Johnny on the spot, like I says. You know we do business? You're the Kruger chauffeur, aren't you, Mr. Rugg? Gargan's the name. Chauffeur and bodyguard. I'm sure you're efficient in both departments, Mr. Gargan. But uh, why the bodyguard? Well, it's like this. The Krugers are important people, see? Mm-hmm. They're likely to be bothered by cranks and other undesirable citizens, get it? They need protection. And I'm the guy that can protect them. Yes, I can see that, Gargan. But now, um, about this letter. Yeah, that's right. Well, do I sing or don't I? That depends on your song, Gargan. First, tell me. How did you manage to get hold of this letter? Well, it's like this. I always get the mail, see? And I always deliver it. But yesterday, Mrs. Kruger and the old dame are with me. I go in and get the mail, and I look through it to see if there's something for me. And I see this letter. Well, when I come out to the car... Mrs. Kruger says, give me the mail. I hands it to her. And when I get it back, this letter ain't with the others. Well, I don't think much about it till last night when this Mayfield dame is bumped off. Then I begin to smell a wreck. And this morning, I did a little mooching around. And here it is. Very graphic, Gargan. How's that? Oh, skip it. Now, uh, what further information have you to give us, Gargan? I can tell you who sent that letter to the Mayfield dame. So? Well, how much? Half a G. Five hundred dollars? That's an expensive song, Gargan. Ah, nuts. You can put it on the expense account. You're right. Nuts it is. The five hundred dollars is yours. Thanks. Here you are. Now, who sent this letter to Louise Mayfield? Well, it was the one who... Gargan! Madam Story, is he dead? Yes. The shot came through that window. Why? To keep him from telling us who sent that letter to Louise. Help me put him in that closet over there. Rizik, I won't let you. You can't. You've got to report it. If I report it now, the police would interfere with all my plans. I need 24 hours. You're risking your reputation. We've taken risks before. But this is concealing a murder. Why do you need 24 hours? To learn the secret of this, Bella. Why? Well, that's one of Mrs. Kruger's handkerchiefs. No, Bella. It's the handkerchief. The one Rokeliff found on Louise Mayfield's body. I'm staking my reputation on this little scrap of lace. <laughs> Story. Potter is back. Oh, that's good, Bella. Did he bring back the uh, handkerchief from the laboratory report? Yes, here they are. Hmm. Just as I thought. Oh, what a horrible use for such a lovely thing. This handkerchief was a murder weapon, Bella. But how could it have been? Because our murderer knew that Louise Mayfield used Gardenia toilet water. But can we find out who sent it? I rather think we can. Bella, get those four lace handkerchiefs that Suzanne got for me from Mrs. Kruger. What are you going to do now? Now, my dear Bella, I'm going out to present a noose to a murderer. Mr. Rokeliff, I wanted to return this handkerchief to you for safekeeping. I'll want it back tomorrow morning. I don't know how at present. But I feel this handkerchief will be the means of proving who killed Louise Mayfield. So, guard it carefully. Well, I'll do that. You can depend on me, Madam Story. Thank you, Mr. Rokeliff. Miss McPeak, the greatest proof that I'm not against you is that I'm going to ask you to keep this handkerchief for me. The most important piece of evidence I have. I have no assurance the murderer would not kill me to get it back. But it would never be supposed that I'd given it to you to guard. Will you keep it for me until tomorrow morning? No, don't worry. I'll keep it safe. Thank you, Miss McPeak. Mrs. Kruger, it's the handkerchief. 
It's the one that was sent to Louis Mayfield. Where'd you get it? Can't tell you that now, but I'm afraid it was the cause of her death. Oh, how horrible. What I'm going to ask you to do is to hold it for me just until tomorrow morning. Gion, you can help. What is the real situation, Madam Story? Oh, I wish I knew. I suspect, but I have no proof. I can go no further without the assistance from the chemist. Whom do you suspect? Oh, you know. I'm afraid that I do. Well, what I want you to do is to keep this for me until tomorrow morning. <laughs> I have asked you, Mr. Guion, Miss McPeak, and Mr. Rowcliffe to meet me here this morning in order that we may determine who murdered Louise Mayfield. Why, what do you mean? You, you know, me. Madam Story? You, you know who killed her? I believe I do, Mrs. Kruger, but I hope to prove it. I know that lace handkerchief was sent to her through the mail was the murder weapon. Perhaps that can tell us something. May I have the handkerchief, please? Why, certainly. Yes, sure, my oh, here you are. Why, I thought I it... don't understand. I say, what is this? So, a trick. That's right, Miss McPeak, a trick. But one only a guilty person need fear. You but know, really, you Madam Story, I don't Bella. understand. Yes, Madam Story. Please take the handkerchiefs one at a time. Mark each in pencil with the initials of the person from whom you receive it. May I have the handkerchief? One at a time. Well, all right. Now, Bella, spread them out on your desk with the initials turned face down. As you probably surmised, none of you had the original handkerchief. That has never left my possession. Here it is. But I don't understand. This handkerchief in my hand is impregnated with a deadly poison. When moistened with alcohol, it releases a lethal gas, which is instantly fatal. May I remind you that perfume is 90% alcohol, and a young girl about to go out on a romantic trip would inevitably moisten it with perfume. How horrible. Yes, Mr. Guion. I agree with but, you. But surely you don't suspect any of us. Why not, Miss McPeak? I found that a murderer is usually actuated by fear. Fear of what the victim might do to them. All of you faced that fear as far as Louise Mayfield was concerned. But one of you feared so deeply that you dared risk murder to protect what you had. You feared loss of position, prestige, supplanting by a younger, more attractive girl, loss of all that had made life worth living. That one person alone knew what the fatal handkerchief contained. I gave each one of you what you thought was that handkerchief. I was curious to see what disposition you would make of the evidence. Bella. Yes? Please examine those four handkerchiefs carefully. And when you've done that, tell me if any of them are changed since they left our hands last evening. Yes. This one has been washed. Washed? Well, I don't want to read the initials on it. T B E G. Teresa. Teresa! Keep away from me. Keep away from me, I say. Keep away from me. I'll shoot. Why do you shoot? She shot herself. Oh. It's all my fault. Poor Teresa. Poor thing. She was all she, she couldn't stand it. She, she couldn't stand it. You know, Mrs. Kruger, it wasn't your fault. It was better so. The end of a passing world. Exit an era. <laughs> have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR mutual series which brings you each week one exciting case. One member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Sir Henry Merivale known to his host of admirers as H.N. in Death in the Dressing Room. This famous detective...
finds a brilliantly clever pickpocket and discovers an even more clever murderer. Tonight's detective was Madame Rosica Story, played by Elizabeth Morgan. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, one thing I found when reading up on Madam's uh, story uh, was that... Uh, Many critics say that uh, her stories suffer from a sort of melodramatic style, and we kind of got that here. And the beginning parts had some similarities to some other programs uh, that have fallen out of st- a style with many critics, including Mr. Keen, Tracer of uh, Lost Persons, and the uh, stories of the Hummers, uh, their various mystery franchises. Overall, I thought it was a good mystery, and it and that one part where, you know, I didn't even get out the calculator to figure out what $526 in 1926 would be in uh, today's money. Uh, but that scene with her being willing to give it and just charge it on the expense account shows that fictional private detectives, regardless of their gender or background, are pretty loose with the expense account. Story was, uh, uh, Madam Story was definitely a somewhat unique character for the era. There were some other female uh, detectives, such as Marple, and then there was Lady Molly of Scotland Yard, who was created by Baroness Orksey, best known for uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel. But unlike uh, Lady Molly, whose only reason for being a crime solver is to save her fiancé from a false charge, Story was a true crime-solving uh, professional. So a very unique character, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll enjoy our next uh, installments of uh, Murder Clinic, which we'll be doing as we get into the uh, Poirot uh, radio series uh, later on this year. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.